Some people call us beer geeks. I've been called worse. As a collector, I've been at it for over 50 years. I started brewing at home. My wife says to me, either go pro or get out of the house with the hobby. Winnipeg was in the middle of nowhere, really. And some describe it as a, as a wild west town. Beer parlors everywhere, drunkenness, and wild times. It was a jumping off point for a lot of people that were heading out west. I guess it was good for the breweries. Everything was delivered by horse and you had barrels in your house and you just, it was part of your natural daily routine. You know, like drinking milk, you had beer in the house. And in the 1890s, I guess it kind of settled down a bit, but uh, breweries opened and closed, they couldn't make it. In the beginning, it was, uh, I, I've, I've referred to it before as uh, some of these places were the original microbreweries. They were small. They were, uh, some of them were just shacks, you know, small buildings. They weren't anything grand. The north end was Drury's and uh, maybe a Four Rouge, and the west end was Shays because their brewery was there. Riedel's was in uh, uh, Elmwood. A fella uh, named Charles Kewell came up from the States. In 1925, they, they built a brewery in St. Boniface. Pelissier's was, uh, they were here quite a few from the 1900s on. It was a, a combination of some uh, breweries, uh, guys that knew what they were doing and some people who didn't. Well, they were businessmen, but they didn't, not, not necessarily uh, brewery men. It's the people who actually are a little bit more passionate and have a little bit more longevity about things. Those are usually the people that, that last a little bit longer and, and, and stick around. It's a tougher slog, obviously, but, you know, um, anything worth doing is doing right. He, he, he had the experience because he came from the States and his father owned a brewery in St. Paul. When he came to Winnipeg, he canoed. Back in those days, there was, there was no electricity. Uh, uh, the only kind of power that you, that you would have used would be steam power. And at that time, this, the, the brewery was too small. He had one horse that would walk in a circle grinding the grain. And then he would make his beer and that horse would have a wagon attached and they would deliver to the hotels. And that's how we started. He slowly grew from, from a, a two-man, one-horse operation and, uh, you know, got bigger and bigger. And as he, as he grew, the, the city grew too. Let's show you a different way of doing things and, and show you how it can be done. And then you tell us if, if you think it's successful or not afterwards. E.L. Drury was, uh, he was always ahead of his time. He, he did things like, he, he was the first brewery in Canada, I believe, to, to adopt the crown and cork cap. The current bottle cap that's in use today has not changed, except for the twist off, it has not changed since 1892 when it was invented. In his personal life, he also liked to, to be on the cutting edge. And yeah, he was the first guy to own an electric car in Winnipeg. He was all, his house, Redwood, uh, which was on the brewery property, was also the first house in Winnipeg to have electric lights. Pretty much everybody I've met that's a brewer um, is generally, you know, real independent spirits. They have a little bit of a knowledge of, of the world outside of their own little, little sort of microcosm in front of them. You take a, a, a guy like E.L. Drury, I mean, he, in my opinion, was he was the Izzy Asper of his time. He was a city councillor, but I think he only did one term. He was a provincial MLA for one term. He donated, you know, land to the city for St. John's Park, and, and he also donated land for, for Redwood Avenue. And initially, the city wanted to build a, a bridge uh, through where St. John's Avenue is. And, uh, of course, he had uh, his kids and relatives uh, living on that street, and they. They talked him into to donating land for Redwood Avenue and then later the, the bridge was built. He was on the parks board so he bought, uh, he urged the city to buy some dairy land way out in the sticks. At the time the city would say, no, no, that's too far, why would we want to park that far out? And it's now a Cinnaboyne Park, 
So he had a, a vision that the city would grow. Anybody who, is, who, who had started a brewery uh, right around the inception of the, when you know, Winnipeg was incorporated, they had a good, uh, a good start. Um, not all of them did well. I think people like uh, E.L. Drury and Patrick Shea uh, came along at the right time. Don and Shea owned the Waverly Hotel down by the CP station. Well, they were selling lots of beer there, so I guess they got the idea, well, let's own a brewery. Patrick Shea obviously was a pretty good businessman himself. And, uh, you know, they, they were able to grow their business to the point where, you know, they, they were millionaires also. Drury was a bit of a, an intellectual, and I think Patrick Shea was more of a, you know, a gregarious kind of a, good time fellow who liked to bet on the ponies. You can't forget the, the Shays Clydesdales. I mean, that's a, that's a story in itself because they, uh, they owned a, a stable of, of award-winning show horses, Clydesdale show horses, and they would uh, appear at all the winter fairs and win prize after prize after prize. And uh, eventually, they sold their horses, and uh, they sold them to Anheuser-Busch. And I think in 1887, John McDonough died, but he kept the name McDonough and Shea right up to after Prohibition. Once Prohibition came along, a lot of them didn't make it. Prohibition came into effect in 1916 in Manitoba. The breweries were under federal legislation, so the provinces could outlaw selling beer in, within the province. But the breweries could still make beer for export. They could sell in Saskatchewan, Northern Ontario, into the States if they wanted. Porter and Stout were very popular. You could get it with a doctor's prescription. Stout was recommended as good for your health. A lot of the breweries uh, had to get into other things, whether it be uh, soda, like uh, soft drinks, or uh, other products like vinegars and teas. Uh, Blackwoods was really popular for a lot of that stuff. But the Blackwood brothers were businessmen from Montreal. Roughly where the bay is, uh, the, the, the art gallery, they had a, a brewery there. They were making soft drinks, but they had a wide, they had, they would bring in tea and coffee and package it up and sell it as Blackwood's coffee, Blackwood's tea. They went under a number of different names, Blackwood Brothers, Blackwood's Limited, uh, Manitoba Brewing and Malting Company. Which was probably better known as the, the Prairie Chicken Brewery, even though it was really never officially called that, but they used the, the Prairie Chicken as, a, as their mascot symbol. The Planton Colony was right beside the Blackwood's house mansion actually it was a fairly big house and that was situated right basically where Memorial Boulevard runs through. Blackwoods actually was one of the, uh, the casualties of Prohibition. They carried on as a soft drink manufacturer. I don't even know what we would do if it was you know like if all of a sudden somebody said oh yeah by the way you can't brew beer in your brewery what are you gonna do you know there's only so much iced tea and soda pop that you can make. I believe it was 1919, they, they just outlawed it outright, and that's when it got really tough. After Prohibition, it was very strictly controlled by the Government uh, Liquor Commission, and uh, you had to get a permit to get a case of beer or a bottle of whiskey. You had companies like Drury's, Shays and Riedel's uh, publishers, they, they managed to hold on. There was a brewery in Elmwood, started off as uh, a small little brewery uh, that were run by uh, two guys, they were the, the Benson brothers. There was a fellow that worked for the, them, his name was uh, Arnold Riedel, and uh, he ended up buying the brewery. He did have to fight a little bit of anti-German sentiment during World War I. 1919 was the year of the general strike here, there was lots of unrest, a lot of soldiers coming back from overseas. There was uh, 
gang of, of uh, rowdies that were that had threatened to come down and, and tear his brewery apart. Someone said, oh, that Riedel, he's, they're celebrating right now, uh, they're having a big party at the brewery, they're celebrating German war victories. And so they all got upset and they went down to the brewery and they trashed the place. Only to be saved by somebody who said, uh, you know, calmed them down and said that, uh, you know, no, that, you know, this guy's a good guy. He's 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 good for the community, and he's he hasn't done anything wrong. It was really hard to make a a, a, a long go of it, and uh, Pellisher certainly did. And I guess they were also selling beer during Prohibition. They could put it in a trunk of the car and drive and drop it off at someone's home, and, which Brewery didn't really, when you think about it. They were tough times in the 1930s, 20s into the 30s. It was uh, prohibition and then depression. So if they could sell some on the side, why not? We still have a legacy from them. Uh, Labatt's still brews club beer. They were selling club beer uh, when it started in the 1930s, along with Country Club. And then clubs, you know, it, it, they dropped that for a while, and then it was brought back in the 1960s. So the name Club Beer has been around for, uh, for a long time. Late in the 1920s, uh, McPherson's Brewery. They took over the, uh, the Furby a brewery that was originally started by Pellishers. And then they later sold, uh, sold out to Fort Gary Brewery, which was uh, uh, started by a, a, a guy named B.W. Ocean. They started up in 1929, and what happened in October was uh, the stock market crashed. So like most breweries or most businesses, they probably struggled quite a bit. Sons of the, of the founder, uh, Norm and John Ocean ran the company. They didn't have to live through, uh, through prohibition here in Manitoba, but they had to live through the, the Second World War, and that was also uh, uh, had its restrictions. There was beer rationing during the war, and uh, of course they were losing a workforce. They stayed in business until about uh, 1960, and they were having a hard time. Molson said, we'll buy the brewery from you. All across Canada, every small center and big center had, had their own breweries. If they were still running after Prohibition, they weren't very efficient, they weren't making a lot of money, and that opened up uh, the scenario for, for buyouts. In Canada, from what went from being 150, 175 different brands of beer, went down to eight. Carling came in and they bought Drury's. The Vats came in, bought Shays. And uh, O'Keefe ended up getting what was Riedel's. Uh, the name had changed to Grants and then it became O'Keefe. And it just kept going. Uh, Molson's bought out Carling O'Keefe, and then there was just two. There was Molson's and Labatt's. And then finally, uh, with the end of of uh, the interprovincial barriers that uh, that legislated that each brewery had to have uh, a plant in each province. Once that was over, then there was no real no reason why any of the breweries needed to be here. Today in Winnipeg. All that exists are the many breweries that once flourished. It's an empty lot, a flea market, and an office complex. Hopefully there is a future. The choice is completely lost and then all of a sudden people start getting wise and you know breweries start opening up again. Personally I was very depressed when uh, Labatt's closed and Molson because we were left without any breweries, and then Fort Gary Brewing started. Richard was our fearless leader. He came to work 
every day and gave it everything he had and led by example. He was a renaissance guy. I hate to use that cliche term, but he was. He really was. He was kind of ahead of his time, I think. You know, it got to the point where you couldn't tell the difference between a Molson and a Labatt's and a Cardi's. And that opened it up for uh, some entrepreneurs that, that thought, hey, I'm going to try brewing something different. The two breweries we have now, they're both doing well. And uh, they're gaining more fans, I would call it. And they make great beers. Right now, they're both doing well, so I think it looks positive. It's not me that says whether the beer is, is a, uh, you know, this is strictly just a Winnipeg beer, right? Um, it's our customers that say that. If it was a Winnipeg feel for our beer, I don't know, I'd have to have like uh, pierogies in it and all kinds of other stuff, right? That's not going to happen anytime soon.